Hey, hey, gang, how are you? How's it going? Joe Casada here. Welcome to the warm up. Good afternoon. It's morning somewhere, just not here. I got an incredible guest today, probably my classiest guest today, a real live novelist, Brad Meltzer. Uh, I should have wore a suit and tie, uh, so I'm going to disappoint him when he sees me. But I uh, hope you guys are doing okay. Hope everybody's staying healthy, all your loved ones friends, uh, acquaintances, and, and, and everything's going well. I am, as I mentioned last time, I'm in now a studio that has windows and there's noise outside because there's construction going on, so I apologize. So it's uh, issue 17. Seven, we've made it this far. I thought Marvel would have like figured out that they didn't want this thing and it should be on the air like by issue three, but we made it to 17. Thank you. Thanks to all my friends everywhere around the world in in the states just everywhere the the your 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 feedback's been great and your questions have been great so uh yes issue 17 social distancing day for me 61 as always there will be a Q&A at the end with Brad so if you have any questions get them ask them quickly uh I cannot see the feed but I have someone at Marvel who is seeing the feed and they'll send me your questions and uh, and hopefully if there's time we'll get them uh, get them uh, asked on the air. So in the meantime, without further ado, let me bring in the man himself, Mr. Brad Meltzer. Brad, how are you, man? Ah, good to see you, brother. How you doing, man? I I, I got to tell you, I'm so happy to get you on the show. Uh, you know, we, we don't get a lot of time to talk often, a lot of FaceTime. So this is literally, you know, I guess uh, <laughs> the best we'll do for right now. I know. I, I was trying to think the last time we were together. Because we obviously email, yeah. and I see you obviously on Twitter. We, we are on Twitter together, but we email to each other. But I was thinking the last time I saw you face to face, we tried it like two months ago when I was in Marvel in the offices, and we missed each other. Mm -hmm. But I actually think it was in your hotel room at Comic Con all those years ago. Yeah, that sounds terrible. You realize, right? It's uh... I know, and it was like it was yeah, <laughs> it, it was exactly as horrible as everyone is imagining right, right now. It was uh, no, I mean it's it, it was you know we it, actually I think that might have been the first time we actually we, you know we 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 met face to face. Uh, and I've been a big fan of yours for, for a long time. So, so it's great to have you on the show. And like I said, finally someone who could class it up a little bit because I got to say my other guests, you know, just, just, been, I've been low browing it, but now I got you, Brad. So, you know, I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> someone, at least someone, my family thinks the exact opposite. So at least someone's impressed, but cause well, I, I was thinking I'm just bringing the bar down. I saw who your guests were. I saw Paul <laughs> Shear last time. That was, Paul's great. you were doing yeah. fancy. Yeah, no, it, it's uh, the show's been fun. You know, we get a get a wide variety of people. So I, I want to talk a little bit. Uh, about your secret origins. Well, maybe they're not so secret, but your origins. I mean, you you are a Brooklyn boy, right? Uh, tell me a little bit about yeah. about you know young Brad Meltzer, where you grew up, how you grew up, and 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 sort of your 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 aspirations and the road that kind of led to you to where you wanted to go. Yeah, I love comics because comics need we need to start with the origin story, right? So, yeah. uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I was the only kid I knew in school who liked comics. There was no one else who liked comics. And you know how it was when we were growing up, like now you can put in the word comics and you'll find millions of people who agree with you. When we were growing up, right. um, we're like the only kid in your school. Maybe if you were lucky, you had one other kid. And in Brooklyn, in fact, in the beginning, there wasn't even a comic store. It was just a bookstore that somehow got a subscription. And mm -hmm. I remember they used to have, their whole bit was, we'll give you all comics were 25 cents a piece in the back issue box, and it was five for a dollar. And so every, I used to get a $5 allowance every week, and I'd go in Brooklyn, I'd go to the store on, I think Fridays were comic days back then, and I'd give them my five bucks, and I would go and pick out my 25 comics, and that was, I would literally feast on that. That was my, that was the best thing that I had. And then um, I remember, then two comic stores actually opened when I was probably about 12 or 13, one was right by the high school. I was at Shell Bank High School and, and Sheepshead Bay High School. But the other one, this is actually fascinating. The other one was down on Avenue U, and it was a comic store where we later figured out, and I don't think I've ever told this on the air, but we later figured out where Paul Levitz shopped and Dan DiDio worked. Or either, or either Paul Levitz worked and Dan DiDio worked, and I went into as a kid. Yeah, you know, Walt Simonson, I was on another stream, and Walt Simonson, had told a story about going to a comic shop where Paul Levitz worked and, and, and was sort of- he, Yeah, he was, it was this was, comic store. Mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it probably was, it probably was. So that- that's... And what's crazy is I remember, I remember, cause I remember when I met, when I met Dan and I met Paul and I was just introduced to comics, they were like, oh, you're from Brooklyn. I'm like, what comic store did you go to? I'm like, there was this tiny one, a hole in the wall, off Avenue U and they were like, and Paul's like, I worked there. And Dan's like, I worked there. And then we were like, 
Wow. That's just crazy. So yeah. um, my comics, you know, growing up, I was just a kid. You know, my family uh, was not, they were not readers at all. My mom read the National Enquirer and the Star, and she thought all news came from there. My dad read the sports page. It was not a single book in my house. Comics made me like weird and different and whatever, um, but I loved them, and I loved them unapologetically. I wasn't like one of those people who like hid them. Mm-hmm. Like if you knew me when I was little, you knew I liked comics and I would read them everywhere. So I grew up, um, you know, on the DC side, it was certainly Justice League was my first, you know, that's what got me crazy and, and right. back issues, and I just collected like mad, and then Teen Titans. And on Marvel, it was... Um, Someone gave me the old Son of Origins. Remember the, the Stanley Son of Origins book? I do. And it was like this compilation that had, it was like a, an original, it was X-Men number. Oh, no, you were prepared. See? You knew where I was going. I did my um, homework. So Son of Origins had a new one. And then they gave you Daredevil one, and then they gave you a new one. I didn't even tell you I was going to say that. How'd you have that? Um, and yeah, and they gave you these, and then you suddenly... <laughs> You were so, this is freaking me out now. I feel like I could say anything, and you're gonna have a no, you're not gonna really, have a graphic board. Really. No, well, you could try. You but know, these, so. <laughs> these were my first one. I remember reading. There was a. I remember X Men was just blew my mind because it was like you know I love team books, and I think I loved, I love that idea that if you were together, you could do something better than yourselves. In fact, the first comic I ever read, Justice League of America 150 was this comic that had um, the key on the cover. They were fighting the key, and at one point in the comic, all the Justice League members are all in these key prisons, and all the key prisons were kind of fixed to each power. So the Superman one had kryptonite in it, and the Flash one vibrated at a different frequency, so he couldn't get out, and the Green Lantern one was yellow, and yellow still worked. And I was like, I remember being you know, nine years old and going like, how were they gonna get out of this? And the way they get out is elongated man stretches down the flashes because he can't get out of his, but flash can vibrate to his. And flash turns elongated man into an actual um, uh, treadmill, like a, not a cosmic treadmill, but a human treadmill. <laughs> and then he runs on him and then Green Lantern moves him down and somehow working together, they get out and then yep. they all get out. But that idea, that simple idea that you're stronger when you're with your friends, mm-hmm. that was catnip. That's what the X-Men was for me. That was like yeah. a school for superheroes and, and all together, you know, Magneto in that issue takes on everyone out one by one. But when they all come together and fight him, now you got magic. Yeah. And now that, that was what was my origin was. And, and that's where comics started for me. But what happened truthfully in Brooklyn, Brooklyn just kind of kicked my family's rear end. My, my dad lost his job at 39 years old. And uh, he said, we're going to have the do over of life. We're going to start over from scratch, have the do-over of life. And I was like, he made it sound like it was fun, Mm -hmm. but to me it wasn't fun. It was scary. It was terrifying. He had no job, no place to live. He had $1,200 to his name. My dad was never any good with money. And he picked us up, moved down to Florida, and drove from New York, from Brooklyn, down to Florida because my grandmother lived there like everyone's grandmother. Yes. And we stayed. We we wouldn't have money for the security deposit to rent a new place. But uh, I remember going down there and it took us a long time till he could save money for a security deposit. But my dad started our lives over from scratch, gave me a fake address so I could go to the wealthy public school. So I went to a better school than I would have actually should have been going to. And I remember the comic store there because everything was defined by comic stores. The comic store was a man, you know, was Glenn Lightfoot. Of course. It was my first comic store. No kidding. Wow. That was my first comic store. So Glenn didn't own it yet, but that one on 163rd Street Mm -hmm. that you used to go to. Yep. So what was it? it? Was your mom was down there, right? My 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 parents, you know, I, I I am I am you know Cuban by descent, and and as as you may or may not know, uh, you know we we Cubans are genetically predisposed at a certain age. We have to migrate south. So somehow or other, I I've avoided that. What do you think Jews do? It's no different. Yeah, yeah, kind of the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so so my my parents uh, usually, you know, usually it's like you know, you get, you get to be eighteen, nineteen, you move away from home. My parents moved away from home because I did not want to go to Florida, so I stayed. But you know, I would end up in Florida, you know, three, four, five times a year, and you know, still had to buy comics. So uh, that that's how I, I kind of got to know the Florida comic scene in a lot of ways. Um, by the way, do you still have your copy of Son of Origin? Of course I do. Yeah, I, I do. I have mine. I, 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 actually, can, I, I could have brought it right. I can literally put my hands on it right now. I have a shelf. <laughs> it's my son's bedroom now, but I have one shelf because it has yeah. the best bookcase that has like my favorite things like as he gets older that he needs to read. Yeah. Top shelf, Son of Origins. Right. I just pulled it out the other day because I was emailing with Bendis 
And we were like, he's, he, he posted Son of Origins, and I was like, that's my book. And he's like, that's my book. I'm like, that's our book, man. That book was killer. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I'm a little bit older than you, so I, I got the original, like, the origin of Marvel Comics and then Son of Origin. And I remember the thing that was really mind-blowing about it was that it had super enhanced color, right? Remember, if, if, put it, if you put it next to comics yeah. at the time, it's yeah. like, oh my God, look at the coloring. This is like, it's like amazing. Um, so so now, now you're in Florida, right? You're, 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 going to, you're going to one of the best high schools in the area. And uh, so uh, you're, you're, still, you're still reading comics. I, so I'm going to guess that the comics are, for you, very much the same thing for me. It was sort of a gateway for wild imagination. Did, 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 it, did it really sort of inspire you that way? Oh, I remember when I moved, um, I, moving at 13 years old wrecked my life. I thought, I thought everything was over. And, and the only thing that was the constant were these heroes. So I remember when we moved, I can tell you exactly what was happening in comics at the time. It was right as the Judas contract was, was peaking and the annual was about to come out. Um, and you didn't know if Terra was good or bad right. in the Teen Titans. I remember, um, it was around the same time, although plus or minus a year there, was when Spidey got the black costume. And I remember being, you know, Secret Wars coming out and being like, what's going to happen here? How are they jumping forward? That was a little after that. But, and I remember not having the actual comic store when I got there. And I, I was kind of adrift until I found it. And I remember by the time I finally found that store, I, I didn't know what happened to Terror. There was no internet to ruin it. You couldn't look up the spoiler. And I remember going in and buying that annual, which is where the ending of the story was. And the cover has her looking at the Titans on one side and Deathstroke is on the other and going like, you know, it was like betrayal is, you know, which way is she going to go? Is she good or is she bad? And I remember looking at that cover and going, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, it's not ruined. Yeah. And I remember at the time, um, before Glenn owned that store, because we, I used to have to bike. I'm not joking. It was probably, like, it was like five to six miles because I live so far from that store, but I used to bike every Saturday and it would take me like, hours to bike there but it was worth it to get comics but finally i found a store that was close to my house and the store uh was closing down it wasn't doing well so the guy who owned the store this was fantastic it was just as i was hitting like 15 so you're 1985 and here mm -hmm. comes dark knight here comes watchman is about yeah. as on on the break and miracle man was coming out in the reprints and he used to cut he used to call me at the house and he would say uh here are the comics that are going to be in this week and he would give me the total, it would be like, whatever, $12. And I would leave $12 under the mat of my house. And he would, while we were at my grandmother's house, he would come, take the money, and leave the comics under the mat. It was like a drug deal. It was total wow. Miami drug deal, but with comic books. And I would come home and like raid the mat and then be like, what did he pick? And he'd always find something that he knew I would like. Yeah. And he was the one who was like, here's a thing called Dark Knight. He gave me Miracle Man. I think Watchmen I knew about, but he was the one who kind of like was like, you are at that precipice between boy and man, mm -hmm. and I'm going to put some hair on your chest. Here's Alan Moore. Here's <laughs> Frank Miller. And and I remember, you know, that was that was a big deal. So comics yeah. for me were they were they were they also were the only consistent friend I had because when you move, you you lose. You start a new school. Anyone who knows you start a new school, you have nobody. Yeah. You were walking into a school out of a cliche in a John Hughes movie, and you're sitting at the table going, I know nobody. And if you could find, you know, now you could talk Marvel Comics with anybody. There's yeah. enough movies that everyone can talk. But I remember back then just looking, you know, who's going to be my friend? Yeah. And I found one kid I remember who liked comics, and it was like he was an island. He was like a refuge. I was just grabbed onto him, was like, let's be friends. You know what? Captain America Shields made from we're going to be friends and and so for me it was it was imagination but it was it was um it was a constant good that I needed in my life I needed I needed that I needed that those friendships you know, plus you, you I mean there also had, must have been a lot of culture shock because culturally it's very very different in Florida than than Brooklyn I mean you probably could not get you know more di di diametrically opposed uh, culturally especially you know at that age I think than 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 those you know than being in those two cities. Uh, so that must have Not been... only that, I, I, I used to have a heavy, thick Brooklyn accent. I mean, I had a oh, heavy, you? thick Brooklyn... Oh, yeah, like, like it was. I was 13, so it kind of got trained out of me, but it was... Brooklyn, for me, when I got to Florida, was what made me different. So they used to volunteer me. Kids would be like, have him read, or, you know, when you had to read out loud in English class, they yeah. would be like, have him read. They would volunteer me because they wanted to hear that Brooklyn thug. 
And I was, you know, I know it sounds so stupid, but I knew how to fight. Like I could, you know, Brooklyn was far tougher than anything in Florida was. Yeah. So I remember there was like a day where the rival high school that was like really tough compared to our fancy school that my parents had like lied to get me into, they were coming to like beat everyone up. And the whole school, they were such like cowards, the whole school of fancy kids, none of them came to school that day. But I went to school that day because I'm like, this is bullshit. Like no one's got, and I'm like, and whatever, whatever fight comes, we'll be ready. And I remember there was this one kid who came up to me, he's like, Meltzer. You're from Brooklyn, right? He's like, look what I got. And he pulls out a switchblade and he puts it on. I'm like, dude, you do not know what to do with a switchblade. You're going to get your ass kicked. And, but Brooklyn was the one thing that made me actually special. Oh. And there's nothing. There's nothing that comic readers right. we want to be. That's what the comics are. That's what our heroes are. So that, that made me feel uh, the culture shock, as you said, was, was vast. Yeah. So... At what point did you start to realize that either you you had a talent for writing or that you wanted to write both at the same time? I mean, when, when did that really start to manifest itself in, in young Brad Meltzer? Yeah, so it was um, ninth grade was Sheila Spicer, my ninth grade English teacher, and she changed my life with three words. She said to me, you can write. And I was like, well, everyone can write. She's like, you know, she said to me, no, no, you know what you're doing. She tried to transfer me into the honors class at the time because I was in all regular classes. My parents had no idea. My parents hadn't gone to four-year colleges. So they didn't know what an honors class was. They didn't know any of that stuff. And she tried to put me in the honors class. I had a conflict. She said, here's what we're going to do. You're going to sit in the corner for the entire year, ignore everything I do on the blackboard, ignore every homework assignment I give. And instead, what you're going to do is do the honors work instead. And what she was really saying was, you're going to thank me later. And sure enough, a decade later, Joe, I go back to her classroom. My first novel was published. I knocked on the door. She said, can I help you? I said, my name is Brad Meltzer. I wrote this book, and it's for you. And wow. she starts crying. And I'm like, why are you crying? She said, I was going to retire this year because I didn't think I was having an impact anymore. And I said, are you kidding? You have 30 students. We have one teacher. And that woman, Miss Spicer, changed my life. She was the first person. And you know who was the first person? Who, we all have that person who was the first person who told you you were good at something. Mm -hmm. Like, so whoever that is, I'm sure you have, whether it was a mentor or a teacher or someone who said, Joe, you can do this, you can draw. That person I know is embedded in your brain, but Miss Spicer was that person for me. Oh, yeah. I, I had the same experience with uh, with Miss Dorothy Cohn. She was, uh, you know, my, my, my fourth, fifth, and sixth grade teacher, and she knew that I had artistic talent. So she would always, you know, and, and, and she was a a really creative person. I mean, she would, she would take us to off Broadway black box theater just to, you know, stuff that we probably should not have been seeing as kids, but she was really, where really, did you live back then? I was in Queens. I was a Queens boy. You, know? you were in Queens. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, so, my whole family. Where in Queens are you? Where, where, where are you? Uh, Jackson Heights. So uh, my whole family is in like Bayside and, you know, Corona Ice King is still at the place. Oh yeah. Well, J Jackson Heights is right next to Corona. So it was, it was the next neighborhood because it was, it, there was Jackson Heights, Corona, then Shea Stadium, you know? So it was all. Oh, all I know. We were Mets fans. Die hard. We knew. Awesome. Uh, love it. So, so, so now you're, you're, so she's, she sparks this love of writing for you. I mean, how, what are the steps you take? I mean, because it, it, I, I know they have a lot of young writers that, that that watch the show or come up to me and they're always like, you know, how do you break in? How do you do it? Uh, and, you know, clearly the answer is a lot of hard work. But what was your road then? I mean, you, you went to college, correct? Uh, Michigan? Yeah, I went to college. I, became, I went to Michigan. I went to University of Michigan. And I was the first in my family to go to a four-year college. So that was just a miracle that I got there. I mean, my family did not know what to do with that. That was like no one had done that in my immediate family. And so... They were, they were just excited I was there, you know, and I think for me, um, two big things kind of really happened. One was meeting Judd Winnick. Judd Winnick was a huge, Judd is a person, I, I went to college and on the wall, I, this was my idea of getting girls, which was, so on my wall, my freshman dorm room wall, there were three posters. One was a Bill Sienkiewicz, um, Batman, question, Green Arrow. Mm -hmm. There was a Joe Jusco um, She-Hulk where she's lifting the weights on the beach. And there was a uh, George Perez Teen Titans poster, which was my favorite piece of art of all time. Right. And I thought this, this was my idea of what was going to get me girls in college, yeah. which shows yeah. you I knew nothing about getting girls in college. Like <laughs> the only thing it got me was, was meeting Judd Winnick because Judd walked into the room and was like, oh, that's George Perez? And I was like, oh, we're going to be friends. Yeah, that's it. And yeah, I remember at the, at the time, 
Yeah, like that is it. You're in the tribe, right? And and so at the time, I remember you always ask people in college, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm-hmm. And and freshman year, day, you know, ten, whatever it is, I meet Judd, and he says to me, "I'm going to be a cartoonist." And I remember thinking, I remember where I was when he physically said the words to me, and I remember thinking, "That's a job." Like I never thought that you could have that. That my family was working, you know. They work, you know, if you didn't have calluses on your hands, you didn't have a real job, like that's not work. And I remember thinking like, oh, there are people, all these comics that I read, people pay to do that? Like you can be that person in there? And that was a huge thing for me. But the other massive thing for me was um, was just getting that feedback. I, you know, sometimes I, I loved writing in stories. So I would go into my psychology class and they would say at the end of the semester, you have to compare Freud and Erickson and and in a five paragraph essay, and that's gonna be your grade for the semester. And I would go in, I'm telling you over and over to every teacher, and I would say, instead of writing that expository essay, can I send Freud and Erickson on a picnic and let them get into a fist fight? And while they're fighting, I'll explain <laughs> what their sides are. And every teacher, because they would have 500 people giving them an expository yeah. essay, they'd always say, sure, do what the hell you want, that's awesome. And I wrote nearly all my papers in dialogue form. I didn't think I was gonna be a novelist, but I knew, that was how I knew how to tell it, how to write. It was like, tell a story, use dialogue. That's what came naturally. And, and then what truthfully happened is I went, uh, I graduated Michigan and was supposed to go to a job in Boston. And this guy in Boston, Eli Siegel said, I'm going to be your mentor. I'm going to take you under my wing. I'm going to teach you all about business. Move your stuff to Boston. Don't go to law school, come to Boston. I'll be your mentor. And I thought, great. So I move all my stuff to Boston, I move everything to Boston. And the week I get to Boston, he leaves the job. Oh, and I'm great. like, oh crap, I, I've wrecked my life, right? I'm like, I've wrecked my life, this is the end. And so I did, Joe, what every one of us would do in moments where we think we wrecked our lives. Everyone, I know you would do it too. I said, I'm gonna write a novel. No, no, it's and, <laughs> and, and I had no idea what I was doing. I truly didn't. I was a history major in college. I never, I wasn't even an English major. But I thought everyone has one story in them and I'm gonna take my shot. And so I wrote my first novel and my first novel got me 24 rejection letters. There were only 20 publishers at the time. I got 24 rejection letters. This, this is a fraternity, Which means some people right? were writing twice. This is Fraternity, right? Fraternity. Well, it was my first book, which was literally about a kid in college. That's all I knew at the time. Mm-hmm. So I went to college. I wrote a book about college. Right. And the week I got my 23rd and 24th rejection letter, uh, I said, if they don't like that book, I'm going to write another. And if they don't like that book, I'm going to write another. And... The week after that 23rd and 24th rejection letter, I started the next book, which became The Tenth Justice, yeah. which was my first published book. So anyone who's writing or wants to write out there, I mean, you know, the only lesson I take from it is don't let anyone tell you no. Like, just you, see, you have to keep going. You see, that that is the key, right? That That's the key. I, 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 when, I, when I lecture about sort of my origin story about how I got to where I am, I wasn't the best artist in my college. I wasn't even the best artist in my high school. Um, but there, there, you know, and I remember having a lecture from a teacher talking about perseverance and how, you know, he's talking to an entire graduating class in college and saying that maybe out of the 150 kids that are here, maybe three of you will be professional artists. And out of those three, it may not even be the three best artists. Most likely it won't. It'll be the three most, uh, the three people that have the, the ability to sort of accept the rejection and continue moving on. And I, th- I think that's a, y- y- you, you nailed that story right on the head with, you know, 24 rejections. I mean, how many people will give up, give up after the second or third? And yet, you know, you just decided I'm going to write another one. And I, I think that's so much the key on, t- on top of being talented because you also, you're not going to get any better unless you start writing more, correct? Yeah, listen, that is I, what I learned on my first book, which I just wrote. I didn't know what I was doing. But in that book, I learned to write. Like if I, you said to me, how do you draw, how do you ride a bicycle? I can tell you, get on the bicycle, find your center of gravity, pedal three miles an hour or more. Um, and you and that's great, you can write all that down. But until you get on a bicycle and pedal, you yeah. will never learn how to ride a bicycle, period. And that's what writing is, that's what art is. You, you, you can, I can tell you, you can take all the classes you want, but until you put that pen to paper, you will never learn how to write or draw until you log and clock the hours. Um, and, and I learned how every, my first book was 800 pages long. My wife took 300 pages, girlfriend at the time, 300 pages threw them in the garbage. But those 300 pages were me crashing the bike on a daily basis. Yeah. And finally I was like, oh, I got my balance, I got my speed, and suddenly I was pedaling and I was going. But it, you, you gotta, 
You know, the, the Wright brothers used to bring extra materials every time they would try to fly their plane, which means every time they went out, they knew they would fail. Right. And they would crash and rebuild and crash and rebuild, and that's why they took off. And so, that's how I look at writing. Crash and rebuild and crash and rebuild. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's like that in any field, especially in the arts. You know, you just, you just, have, to, you just have to fall down. Uh, in order to and, and but also it's not just a matter of falling down it's like what do you learn from falling down right because if you fall down and just get up and you say was it my fault well you're not going to learn anything but what I'm surprised so, so you went right into writing novels so writing comics wasn't something that immediately you said well I, that's really where I want to go it's, it's, it's more the novels route you know what it's funny I never ever started thinking I'm going to write comics because in an odd way it, it didn't occur to me I know it sounds stupid but that seemed farther. Like I needed, I needed someone else to do that. I needed, I can't draw. Anyone who's seen my drawings, like I can't draw. So I can never do a comic because I don't, you know, that was too odd for me. And Judd was obviously doing comic strips at the time. So it wasn't like I had access to an artist like yourself or someone who I knew or I had a buddy who was like, let's do a, some kind of ash can thing. So for me, it was that. And then what happened was um, it was Bob Shrek. Again, thanks to Judd, Bob Shrek was to our mutual friend, Kevin Smith, who we love and adore. Like oh, yeah. Kevin changed my life. Cause Kevin Smith at the time, so people always say, how did you break in the writing uh, comics? And I always say, I wrote four novels. And the reason is, is because <laughs> when my fourth novel came out, the last person in line at the book event was Bob Shrek, who was the editor at the time of Green Arrow. He was editing Kevin mm -hmm. Smith on Green Arrow at DC yeah. Comics. And he came in line and Judd had made an introduction for us. And he said to me, um, would you, I'm not joking in line said, would you like to write green arrow? And I looked up at him and I was like, I've been waiting my whole life for someone to ask me that question. Cause I, I had put even in my first book, right. I've been hiding since then comic book references. And I know it's easy and it seems silly now, but I've been doing this for 20 plus years. My first book ever, literally the, the Supreme court justices and yeah. the 10th justice are all named after the Watchmen, And no one right. knew it back then. I know it's easy now. No one knew what it was. I'd, I'd travel the country to 20 cities. And one stop, one place in like some tiny little town, someone will go, Osterman, nice. And I'm like, nice. come be my friend, come be my friend. <laughs> and, and, and so Shrek basically said to me, I'll never forget, he said, here's, he says, Green Arrow is our number one book. And it's our number one superhero book that we have right now. Kevin Smith, famous director, is writing it. You can't tell anyone he's about to leave. And when he leaves, if I give our number one superhero book to someone else in comics, everyone's gonna throw a hissy fit. But if I take our number one superhero book and give it to a novelist that no one's really knows, no one's ever read before, everyone's gonna stop and say, what does DC Comics know that I don't know? And Bob mm -hmm. Shrek, I'll never forget, said to me, Brad, you're, this is our number one selling superhero book. You are either gonna fail on a big stage or you're gonna succeed on a big stage. And it's up to you if you wanna take the chance. And I was like, I will take that chance any day. I will always bet on myself. That's and awesome. I, I remember on tour coming up with the idea for what became the Archer's Quest. Thanks to my friend Noah, he and I were blabbing back and forth, and and that was my starting comics right there. Yeah, and and then you know sticking with comic work, I mean, I mean, you know, you you go from a, a great run on on Green Arrow, and and then you have this idea for uh, a, a DC sort of you know big event story, t you know that that just encompasses all the heroes. Uh, in, in a book called Identity Crisis, which was just, you know, I was editor in chief at the time, so I was cursing your name because you were doing so well in the sales. It was the only book that was. Oh, I remember. Was, you know, I remember. It, trust it, me, I remember have, talking. We, you know, we, we'd have like like nine out of the ten, top ten, and there would always be this one DC book, and it was like, oh, Meltzer, oh, Smith, you know. <laughs> uh, but it was, it's just, it was an amazing, an amazing book. Uh, how did the the idea was this something that you know, an idea that you you had sort of in because you're I. I mean, I think it's clear that you you started out with DC, so so such so probably feels more like home than the Marvel. You or maybe it's both. But I mean, I I wonder, did you have this idea early on, like just something you like, you know, someday if I ever get a chance, or is this something that sort of started percolating as you were writing Green Arrow? Yeah, you know what, I didn't. I actually stepped away because I need to write my novel. So I stepped away from. The, I said to them, listen, I can only do because they were like, you want to do. I'm like, I can only do four issues. I promised them I'd only do four. I wound up leading to six because I didn't really understand comic pacing with Green Arrow. Um, but I knew I had to get back to my real job. And then um, uh, and then what happened was, truthfully, 9-11 happened. And I know it'll sound crazy, but I remember talking to Dan DiDio. And this was there was a real shift right here. So, you know, Dan came in and, you know, it was, 
I'll never forget. I mean, Dan DiDio came to us and it was like me and Jeff Johns and, and Jeff was, he was sleeping at my house actually when I was writing this. But I remember Dan came to me and said, um, I want you, he's like, listen, 9-11 just happened. He said, remember that time and go back right now. If you think about what happened to 9-11, it was when after 9-11 happened and it's the same thing we're seeing right now with COVID is everyone is, we used to just take all of our firefighters for granted, our cops mm -hmm. for granted, our, yeah. our military men and women in the military for granted. And when 9-11 happened, everyone would go up to anyone in the uniform and say, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for what you do for us on a daily basis. You, and Dan said to me, we, we now look at our policemen and policewomen and, and fire people as people who are risking their lives every day. They're not just waving in a parade. They're not just dressing up in costume like they are truly, every time they put on their uniform, we now appreciate that they are risking their lives. And he said to me, Brad, we want to do a story. And he said a small emotional story. It wasn't supposed to be a big crossover. It was nothing. It was like a small emotional story where we feel that the DC Universe heroes, we need that feeling for them, that when they put on their uniforms, we really feel like they're going to risk their lives. And he gave me this whole list of all the people I could murder. It had like every big name you can think of on it. He was like, this is the death list. Kill whoever you want. And I looked at the list and I remember going, I don't want to kill any of these people because they're all going to come back. We all know how mm -hmm. comics work. And on that list, I remember talking to Mike Carlin and he was like, what about, because he, he knew I had no interest. I said, no, I said, I don't want to do it. It, it. it just seems like a stunt and it does, I don't know if it's going to work. And I remember he said to me, what about Sue Dibney? And I remember thinking, you know, again, I don't, why would anyone kill Sue Dibney? She's like nice. Like, why would anyone do that? And he said, just think about it. And I truly was like, it's not going to work, but I'll think about it. And I don't know, again, with the craziness of time, whether it was a week or a month, but a, a period of time went by and I just couldn't shake the idea. And I went and I remember the fully formed idea came and I said, I got it. I got it. I got it. Let me go work on this. And I went back to Mike Carlin at the time and to Dan and I said, here's what I want to do. It's a murder mystery and we're going to really pull apart the DC universe. And they said, give us the list of characters you want. And I gave them the list and they were like, this is who you want? Like you want elongated man and firehawk, you want <laughs> Captain Boomer, like all the obscure heroes, you know, and villains. And they were like, this is what you want? I'm like, yeah, because there's all this room to play with their character and all the emotions. And I literally wrote Identity Crisis as a novel. I wrote all seven issues. By the time I handed in issue one, they thought I was working on one. I was done with all the issues because that's how I knew to write. And I felt like, I felt like it would be bad if I handed in all seven at once. Like they would be like, you didn't work hard enough. So I just pretended they weren't there. And I would like mark the calendar and be like, okay, 30 days went by, hand him another one. And I never, the funny part was, is it, it was again, never supposed to be a crossover, never supposed to be anything mm -hmm. big. And then um, Rags' art came in and the, and the scripts came in and Dan was like, oh, we, we're gonna do something different with this book. And I was like, whatever you wanna do is fine. I said, I make one request. I said, comics, everything is ruined in comics. And it went back to my origin. It went back to, mm -hmm. the, to the Titans. I said, I never knew in the Teen Titans, if terror was good or bad, the only thing I request is don't let anyone read the book. Don't give it out to comic stores a week early. Yeah. Don't let anyone know how it ends. And we just put it out there. And then the truth is, Joe, I wish I could take credit. That book changed my life. I mean, it yeah. took off in a way that I don't think any of us ever anticipated. Yeah, I will. I mean, it was it, it, it was a great read. It still is a great read. Uh, so so anybody who hasn't read it, uh, please, you know, pick up the collection. It, it's it's uh it's comics in its highest form. It really is, uh, from art to, to writing. Uh, and then, and then you go and win an Eisner. You just, you just get into the into the comics industry and you win an Eisner. Really? Uh, really no, Dan Didio, Dan Didio, Trust me, I trust. That was the. I did not think I was going to win either. Um, <laughs> Dan came to me, and I remember it was you know Jeff and Judd and 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 uh, Dan knew my weakness was Justice League. He knew that was my book, and he said, and he and I was like, I can't come back, I can't do anything. And he's like, I'll give you Justice League, you can do it from one. I'm like, I can't say no, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't not do that. And obviously, that was your you know, book. at that point, I had met everyone, I had met you by then, and everyone was always like, What do you want to do? What do you want to do? And I, I was like, I can't do anything, I have no time. But Justice League was my weakness, mm -hmm. um, and 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 that issue number eleven would. Okay. I always yeah. loved that idea. I was like, why don't you do the whole issue with just that? It goes back to Spider-Man, of course, what is it, 33, where, you know, uh, 
is just the greatest of all stories where you're just in that moment. So Marvel had a big play in those stories as well, mm-hmm. even back to when I was a kid. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and you actually, you actually did something for us, Brad. It's a, uh, you know, you, you, and, and again, so, so, so here comes Marvel Comics 1000, right? And I get invited to be a part of it also. And, and the cool thing is that, that, you know, you, you get to, you get one page, one page to tell a story. Uh, which is pretty daunting, right? And 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 so I had to start. I'm like, okay, I think I come, come with something really good. I, I've got something. It's a little daredevil story, and I submit mine. And then the book comes out, and I get to your page, and I'm like, oh, I've done it all wrong. I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's. I'm gonna I'm gonna get back to you here because I, I've got the I got the page actually here. Uh, you know, I don't know if I'm spoiling anything, but it was it was just no, such a beautiful it, story. Okay. Um, and that's uh, Julian. Julian, you know, Tedesco. I mean, he oh he God. just yes. killed that page. Yeah. And then again, but again, Tom Brevoort, full credit. Tom knew my weakness. I'm like, you know, I talked to Tom for years. I've talked to you for years about doing stuff with Marvel. It's just been yeah. physical time, not any lack of love or anything like. And Tom's like, I'm like, I can't do it, Tom. And he's like, it's one page. Yeah, it's one page. I said, let me see if I have something good because I don't want to do it to do it. If I'm going to do something with Marvel, I want it to be like something special and. It took me a while to crack it, and when we cracked it, um, it was obviously I, you know, I pitched it to to Tom, and I said, you know, here's the story. It's going to be Peter Parker swings in, and here's the great here's the great button on this story. Is I said Peter Parker's going to swing in. Uh, he saves the day. He sees a woman, pregnant woman, and she says, "Tell me your name. You just saved my life." And he says, "I can't tell you my name." She goes, "No, no, you just saved my life. I'm going to name my baby after you. Tell me your name." Yeah. He's like, I'm not telling you my name. I do the jokes. So she's like, just tell. I'm going to name my baby after you. Please tell me your name. And Peter takes a beat and says, Ben. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to a baby being born. She says, we're calling him Ben. And then you see an African American couple say, with a new baby, we're calling him Ben. An Asian couple with a baby, we're calling him Ben. A gay couple with a baby, we're calling him Ben. This one with a baby. And the idea is, of course, that Peter Parker's been doing this over. And people are. And you see, mm-hmm. without ever having to show it, all thanks to Julian. That over and over and over, he's doing this over and over. And I love that. And the great part was, the, the ending of the story is, as you knew, Marvel 1000, every comic had to match up with like, you know, they made it kind of, they worked backwards and figured out how that story fits in the Marvel universe. So, mm-hmm. you know, this was in 1960, this was in 1970, this was 1980. And Tom, out of nowhere, not talking to me at all, but read it. And I never said this in any interview, so he, he did not know this. But the first Marvel comic that I remember reading as a fan, beside uh, Son of Origins, was Spider-Man 252, where he gets the black costume. Okay. And Tom's like, I want this to reflect 252. I'm like, Tom, that's my first real Marvel comic as a fan. So the whole thing just, oh, uh, was a full circle. It was beautiful. That's crazy. Um, and, and, and the great thing about the story, though, is that you know, if you read reviews of that particular anthology, um, good or bad, every single review cites that story as probably the best story in the book. It, it just, it was there so were great. There were plenty of great stories in the book. I trust no, me, I love doing there were, it. But, it. I mean, I have to, really I have to say, I, I read it and I'm like, I mean, it, it, you know, it got me right here. It was, uh, it was just I don't know, the one thing that actually got me, I'll tell you what did get me though, is it just like last week on Twitter, two weeks ago on Twitter, someone said, hey Brad, I read your Marvel 1000 story and I just want you to introduce our new baby, Ben. Oh no, wow. And he says, what kind of Ben? And, and I was like, Okay, now we're in just crazy town here. Right. I mean, that was like, and you know the power of these comic heroes yeah. are so beyond you and I, right? You know they're so much bigger than we will ever be. And it was just like my experience in that moment. And we've had people who have named their kids and done, but it, that was beyond. That was That's beyond wonderful. all. That's one. So, Brad, I mean, I want to get to the kid conspiracy, but before we do, I mean, I, you also have, uh, you do kids' books as well, right? And you've got a great series of Chris kids. Eliopoulos. But Chris Eliopoulos, one of my favorite people in the world, right? And it's about ordinary people who changed the world. Uh, and you have some new ones that are coming out, right? So, so, so for the, the listeners and viewers out there, can you give us a little lowdown on, on, on the books in case uh, they're looking for something to keep their kids busy during this time? Yeah, so we did these, Chris and I do these because we wanted our kids, again, right from the place of comics, we wanted our kids to have better heroes to grow up with like we had. And we took real heroes in this one. So we've done I Am Amelia Earhart. You know, characters that can teach you kindness and compassion and perseverance. Mm -hmm. So we started with I Am Amelia Earhart and I Am Abraham Lincoln. We did, as you saw just there, our newest ones were um, I Am Leonardo da Vinci. The new ones coming in October, there's Leonardo da Vinci. The new ones that are coming out are Ben Franklin and Anne Frank. Um, and then the other new one that also just came out was, um, and Anne Frank will be, you'll appreciate this. I'll tell you this now is 
in the Anne Frank one, uh, again, I, we, we treat these all as comics. Everyone's like, they're children's books. I'm like, they're comics. Yeah. And in the Anne Frank one, we really wanted to make it feel different than every other book. So I had Chris take, when, once she goes and hides in the attic, she, the, the panels actually shrink down. And we, uh-huh. we kind of letterbox the whole thing okay. so that there's black on top and black on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And you see the space that she's living in is shrinking and it's totally squeezing her. And it's an incredible book. Chris just drew the heck out of it. And then we also, the other new one that came out is I Am Walt Disney, um, which, you know, obviously working with uh, the, the mothership itself was, was <laughs> incredible to give us access to the Disney archives, you know. And we had done, we had done I Am Jim Henson. We'd done obviously other books. But, you know, dealing with the master himself was, you know, an incredible yeah. opportunity. So we love doing these books. That's the whole series you can see there. Yeah, how many times? Um, but we, so Leonardo da Vinci is our 20th. So that that wow. one just came out. And then Ben Franklin and Anne Frank are 21 and 22. And our goal is to build, help you build a library of real heroes for your kids, mm-hmm. for your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews. Um, and I love that people buy them as baby gifts and they buy them for, you know, to read them. We, have, we sell them to adults. I have so many adults who read them yeah. and they're just like, I like your comics. I want to read the book. So it, it's been really amazing. And I think the world is craving stories with heroes at this point, you know, and, and which I think is a great segue to, to, to talk about, well, it's saying, I'm saying I'm, uh, my graphics are getting a little bit screwy here. Uh, I think, I think it's time that we could talk a little bit about, uh, about the newest book. Uh, you know, I, 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 I was, we were talking, you know, before we started here, I, I just finished it today and I loved every minute of it. It, uh, it even though, you know, it, it, it's about a foiled uh, attempt on President, President Lincoln's uh, life. Not, you know, the, clearly we know how his life ends, but clearly we know that this very first attempt doesn't work. So you know the ending of the story, and yet you manage to weave this tale, and and to, to you sucked me in to the point where I'm thinking, well, is he going to be okay? Is he going to be okay? Because it just, <laughs> it just it, 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 you're just masterful at it. Um, so I wanted to ask you though. I mean. There've been so many books written about Lincoln, um, and but you found this this sort of little known assassination attempt. I mean, what was your what was your road into this story? Because it, it although it's about this assassination attempt, it's really a book about Lincoln in this sliced moment in time before becoming president, and 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 and, and sort of his origin story uh, before he, before the the, the 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 you know the the weight of the Civil War falls squarely on his shoulders. Uh, it, it's a it's a great moment in time. And so, how did you pick this? I mean, how did how did you uh, you know come across this sort of little known uh, conspiracy to kill him? Yeah, so we did a, a show on the History Channel a few years back called Decoded. Mm-hmm. And while working on Decoded, I think that's where I first heard about the story. I can't even pinpoint the exact day, but I, I had kind of like the like doing a, a jigsaw puzzle. I had the outline, right? Mm-hmm. I had the edges and the and the and the flat pieces, but I had nothing in the middle. But it's what you said, right? I mean, we all know how Abraham Lincoln is killed by John Wilkes Booth. Yeah. But this is the story, and that ends Abraham Lincoln's presidency. But this is the story of of the secret plot to kill Abraham Lincoln at the very start. And, and again, talk about, you know, drawing and writing comics the Marvel way, like this was to me the Marvel way, because I love the idea that we all know Abraham Lincoln um, as a finished work, right? He writes, right. It's, we got the Emancipation Proclamation, you, the slaves, obviously slavery goes away, we win the Civil War. We know the ending of his story. What was far more interesting to me was the beginning of his story, the beginning of his presidency, where he's completely... He's, he doubts himself. He doesn't know if it's going to work. I mean, he's got to take a train to be sworn in. He's, he's literally going to be sworn in as the 16th president. A train has to take him from Springfield, Illinois, where he lives. It's got to take him to Washington, D.C. The only way to get there is you've got to go through Baltimore. And Maryland at the time was a slave state. So the plot is very simple. A secret society plans to kill him and murder him before, as he's coming through Baltimore before he ever gets sworn in. They want to end his presidency before it begins. And that's where the book begins. And yeah, I see there's the Knights of the Golden Circle. That's the secret society that the emblem. And you'll get to see in the book, you see this secret society, you see what they stand for. We were able to find their secret handshakes, their secret code words. Um, why? Because I love that stuff. I want to show that stuff. And, and you're on, you know, you're, you literally are on, the, on a train, a speeding train in the middle of the night. On the train is our, lots of passengers. We're focused on three of them. There's a businessman, there's a woman, and she has an invalid brother. Mm-hmm. But none of them are who they say they are. Because the man is actually famed detective Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, one of the most famous detectives you know of any time period. There's Alan Pinkerton right there. Yeah. You're fast at this. Um, 
the woman, the woman is Kate Warren, who's America's first female private eye. And her so-called brother is not her brother, and he's certainly not an invalid. It's Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and they give him a code name, they put him in disguise, they disguise Abraham Lincoln, put him on this train flying through the middle of the night to avoid this secret society that wants to kill him. I just ruined chapter one of the Lincoln Conspiracy for you, but that's chapter one. But you know, this story was like, it was like a comic to me. It was an adventure tale. And yes, you know the ending, but it's the Alfred Hitchcock quote, or to paraphrase, right? It's not the bang that's scary. It's the anticipation of it. And you're slowly watching Abraham Lincoln almost die. And you see in every scene, you read it now, right? Like you realize, oh my gosh, if this works and you see how close they come, all of history changes. It's a banana story. Well, it's it's got it's got incredible characters in it. It's got um, the, the time period, right? To, to you 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 really 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 uh, immerse us in that time period, that pre Civil War period, as 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 states are are are, are leaving the Union before he's even become president, uh, and, and you, you 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 get that sense of impending doom and that weight that is just building, and he hasn't even been inaugurated yet. But then you introduce us to all these great great characters and, and there's little tidbit stories and, and, and I don't want to I don't want to spoil all of them because it, there's some great stuff about like what Lincoln was doing uh, as the returns were coming in and, and just just little bits of characterization that I think added so much depth to it but can you talk about like like one of my favorite stories is the story about a letter that he gets from a little girl uh, can you tell that story oh or I love that something? story oh you really read the book oh I'm happy now so here's the I love that so it's one of my favorite stories, right? Mm-hmm. And, and so it's a story about um, Lincoln at the time, clean shaven. That's how he was. That's how he looked back then. And he's running for the presidency and, and he gets the nomination. You know, again, we all know Lincoln is like the greatest guy. He's like, he's the man, $5 bill. Mm-hmm. But this is Lincoln 1.0. And as we said, you know, he's just starting. He's just figuring out. He's, he's second guessing himself. He doesn't know if he's going to win. When he finds, he, he gets. Like, that's just a normal guy. And he gets this letter from an 11-year-old girl named Grace Bedell. And Grace Bedell says to him, listen, my brothers, some are going to vote for you, some aren't. I think you would do a lot better, sir, if you grew a beard. And Abraham Lincoln writes her back and says, thank you for the advice. I'm going to grow a beard. And everyone's like, is that why he really grows a beard? And when his train gets through the state, one of the stations it stops at is Grace Bedell Station. And this little girl, he sends her a note, says, I'm going to be coming through your town. She comes racing up to him. This is actually the first picture, I'm going to tell you. So yeah. he starts growing his beard. This is the first picture right here that is ever shown when Abraham Lincoln starts growing his beard. It's not even fully formed yet. And when he sees the little 11-year-old Grace Bedell at the train station, he says, Grace, Grace, here's the beard I grew for you. And that's why we get America's most famous beard in the world. It's an 11 year old girl. <laughs> and I like, love that. I mean, that's just beard. so awesome. Yeah. Right. I mean, and that's the thing is it just shows you the power. I mean, Lincoln is not some like figure you go worship at in Washington, D.C. Now Lincoln is alive again. He's a human being and he's writing a letter and he's like, do I look good or am I ugly? And, and now he's just like the rest of us. Right. He's yeah. amazing and he's terrified and he's scared and he's brave. And that's how we all are. That's why we love Peter Parker. Yeah. Right. It's like because he's one of us. And, and when you can show it, you don't have to make it up. It's all nonfiction. This all really happened. Abraham Lincoln, you see in this book, you see the human moments and, and he comes alive. He, he, he really does. I mean, and, and, and you know, what, what definitely comes through is, is his self-deprecating humor. Right. I mean, he understands he's not, you know, he's not a conventional looking man. You know, he's, he's not a conventionally attractive looking man. And, 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 and he gets, you know, they, they part part of the opposing political views uh, you know, or, 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 uh, or part, part of the arguments against him. They even use his actual looks and the way he dresses uh, to, to, to sort of, sort of you know, slander him in whatever way is possible. So he's very aware of it, but he's the first one to make fun of himself, which is, again, also, you know, with the heroes that we love, people like Peter Parker, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely trait. Uh, but you do bring him alive in this story. And, and, but you also bring alive... Alan Pinker, Pinkerton and, and I didn't I mean I've known of the Pinkerton you know agency and, and, and I'd known about him but not as deep as you go into his character and, and, and his history where he comes because it, it's almost as much his story as it is uh, Lincoln and also the conspirators yeah no and you have like that's the thing is you every you know you you think we're making this up when we you know when we do our comics 
you know, these are the great stories. We're just following the great stories. You don't need to make up a hero or a villain. There's a hero, there's a villain, like the cast of characters, you, you know, the good ones rise and that's why you tell their stories. And, and when you find something in them, whether it's like, you know, I'm gonna tell the story of some minor character, or I got a Flash Gordon story, you know, a Flash, you know, whatever it might be, whether it's outer space, whether it's here, what, you know, I, I say Flash Gordon, I meant Flash Thompson. That was good. Um, <laughs> but Flash Thompson, you know, you may take a minor character and find something in them. Yeah. To me, that was like, you know, having the, the best J. Jonah Jameson story. It's like Alan Pinkerton is, is one of the stars of the story. And one of my favorite moments is um, where Alan Pinkerton has to tell Abraham Lincoln that there's a plot to kill him. Mm -hmm. And they're in the hotel room. It's late at night. Lincoln's exhausted. He's been shaking hands all day. And he says, listen, sir, we found a credible threat against you. We know you have a big event in Philadelphia tomorrow. Why don't we we'll skip the event in Philly. We'll get you to Washington early. We're going to save your life. And Abraham Lincoln says... I'm not skipping the event in Philadelphia. And he's like, why? And you know what he's doing in Philadelphia the next day? They're there to raise a flag in front of Independence Hall where the Declaration of Independence was was uh, signed. And they're, oh, actually, you got it. Yeah, there's, they're literally raising that flag. That's in Philadelphia. And they're going to raise that flag to honor one of Abraham Lincoln's heroes, a man named George Washington. They're honoring George Washington's birthday. And this giant flag is being pulled up on Independence Hall and Abraham Lincoln is not missing George Washington's birthday party. No way. And he goes there and he gives a speech. God bless Josh Mensch, who I worked on the book with, our co-writer on the book. And he said, yeah. yeah, yeah. So Josh is a superstar. I mean, um, he was our executive producer and he's an award-winning documentarian. His research and writing are incredible. And he found the actual speech, the words that Lincoln says in that photo. And Lincoln goes in front of everyone, talks about how the Declaration, everyone should have an equal chance. He says that if we cannot save the country without losing that, and then Abraham Lincoln pauses, and he says, I was about to say that you should assassinate me on this spot rather than have me surrender. And I love that Abraham Lincoln, in that moment, he knows there's a plot to kill him when he <laughs> says, assassinate me on this spot. And it's soon after, right where that photo is, is the moment where they whisk him out of there. I won't tell you how, because I'll ruin the book, but you'll mm -hmm. see how they whisk him out of there. You'll see the secret code name they give him, the disguise they put him in. And I'm like, this is incredible stuff. And it all happened. And yeah. you have, there's even physical proof of it, which is even more amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, it, it reads like a modern, you know, sort of adventure, uh, adventure story. I mean, the, the Pinkerton group and all the characters and detectives that are introduced, I mean, you know, it might as well be Mission Impossible. It, it, just, it, it just takes place in a different time period. And what I found fascinating was that, that you could tell that so much of what was happening and so much of the plans that they were making, right, undercover plans, way to, ways of getting Lincoln out of situations, were probably, are, are probably things that are, that are done today, but really were, were being created on the spot there, right? Because so much of what the Secret Service does and, you know, and, and, and the President's security is based a lot on what Pinkerton was doing at this time. Because he and, he and Lincoln then, then had a relationship sort of after this, did they not? Yeah, no, and listen, Pinkerton, you know, Pinkerton's great strength, his superpower was he'll infiltrate your life. He'll figure out, <laughs> yeah. okay, Joe, I'm gonna find out who your friends are, where you like to eat, what bar you frequent, what's your drink, and then he'll go in the bar before you get there, he'll order the drink. As you come in, he notice you the you know, you notice, wait, he oh you, oh I have that I, that's my favorite drink too. He go and you goes he goes, Yeah, I like this drink, I'm new to town. The only person I know is I know Jimmy. Oh, you know Jimmy, I know Jimmy. Jimmy. And you yeah. think you found a new best friend. So he you you know, you invite him back to your secret society meeting. And it sounds naive now, but back then they didn't know. They didn't watch fifty episodes of Law and Order. <laughs> So Alan Pinkerton is inventing all this stuff. He's like a termite, right? Termites eat from the inside. Mm -hmm. They eat that structural column, and then the whole building crumbles. Yeah. And Alan Pinkerton takes no crap from anyone. He hires a female private eye when no one hires female private eyes. That's another great story. 26-year-old woman. Yeah. Right, Kate Warren, Kate Warren is a 26-year-old woman, walks into his office, says, I saw an ad for a private eye, hire me. At a time when no one is hiring anyone mm -hmm. to be a female private eye. And he says, why? You should be the secretary. And she's like, listen, women will talk to me. Wives will talk to me. And you know what? Men brag to me. They try to impress me. And Alan Pinkerton, it dawned on him, oh my God, she's right. People are going to talk to her very differently than they're ever going to talk to me. And that's what brings on the case to save Abraham Lincoln's life. Yeah. This is fantastic. I got, this is the Avengers 1.0. It's, it, you yeah. know, it's perfect. And um, obviously, you know, all I'm doing is channeling the story and pulling the parts out, but the context and where it's set and giving, you know, I think we make it and we, you know, it's worth talking about, especially to you. I mean, we, we do make a, a huge 
And I think it infects the comic industry. We take our heroes, especially these days, and we put them up on these pedestals. You know, in real life heroes like Abraham Lincoln, we build monuments. Um, but even in comics, we, you know, we're like, oh, we, you know, Spider-Man can only do these things. We want to limit them. They're, they're untouchable. And when we do that, we do our heroes a great disservice yeah. because we forget that they're like us. The best thing of any hero you look up to is they're like us. And I'm well aware that Peter Parker and Steve Rogers are very different than Abraham Lincoln and, and George Washington. One's, you know, two are real and two are, you know, are imaginary. But they're no different to me at all because the greatest hero stories we tell are not stories about other people or about other characters even. The stories you love most tell you something about yourself. That's the best story. It has to yeah. tell you something about yourself. It has to hit you right here and you go, oh, that's me. And when we do that and we hold them up to these pedestals, um, we're, we're not seeing all of it and we're, and we're forgetting that they're human like us and, and we're forgetting that they're scared. And that's not a bad thing. That just shows we're human. So I love that, you know, it, whether it's identity crisis or whether it's Spider-Man, you know, Marvel 1000, my goal is to show that human thing or Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to find that human moment. Um, and that's what I just always will go to is like, don't think that they're the best to see them just like yourself and you'll yeah. find something far more powerful. Yeah. Well, you, well, you do talk to talk about, you know, the, the, the depression that he was going through, the, the pressure that he was, it, it's, it's all very, very human stuff. And, 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 you know, you, you, in, in my mind's eye, I could see Lincoln, I could feel Lincoln. Uh, you definitely get into that, into that mindset and, and even Pinkerton and, and, and even the conspirators. I think also what helps is that, that, that you, you pepper the story with, 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 with Pinkerton's actual, you know, journal entries uh and, and and these great speeches that you uncover and and there are places where you just can't find the stuff clearly but the stuff that you do find is 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 amazing because it adds so much color because you also get a sense of the way that people talked at that time what what though the, in, in researching this book and writing this book what did you find that surprised because you're a history buff i know so did you find anything you went whoa i didn't know that or whoa i wasn't expecting that I mean, most of the story, I, I, again, I only had the contours. I, I think what struck me more than anything, um, and the reason we did, we, we actually had a number of Abraham Lincoln stories that we were, we were like, should we do this one or do this one or do this one? There were, there were some amazing stories about his life. But the reason we chose to do this one was the context of where it was in this, at the beginning of the Civil War. Because it's a time in society where the country's split in two. Whatever side you're on, you hate the other side. You think the other side are horrible, awful people. Does that sound familiar to you, right? Like that's just exactly where we are now as a culture, I, I, and it I let think, us. I, I think that's why the book's going to resonate, to be honest with you. But I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, and, and for me, it was like I always feel like you have to tell the story of where you are now. History is not interesting if it's just like, oh, in 1861, this passed them and by such and such was. I don't care about that. Show me the human beings, and show me something that we can learn from today. And I think what struck me and caught me off guard was. And this will sound naive because I know it's a civil war and we know it's brother against brother and we know all the cliches that go with it. But I was struck by the, the level of hatred, the level of racism, the level of venom that came to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he is so hated that 10 different states won't even put his name on the presidential ballot, even though he's a rightful nominee, because they're like that guy. He is he, he thinks blacks and whites are equal. His name is not going on the ballot. And I'm like, it's one thing to know that. You hate the other side. It's another thing to want the other side dead. Yeah. And that scene in chapter, I think it's three, um, it's three or four, where you see Charles Sumner, Senator Charles Sumner, beat up on the Senate floor with the cane, yeah, yeah. beat to a bloody pulp. <laughs> yeah. You're like, this is brutal. They are physically beating up a senator on the Senate floor. And who's doing the beating? Another congressman with his like crab and goyle standing guard so no one can stop it. I mean, it's an incredible moment in American history. And that that venom caught me off guard. I was yeah. I was like, oh, this is this is worse. They didn't tell us this in high school. This would have this would have scared the crap out of us. Yeah, and and you know it it it, it certainly resonates right because of, of of today. But I think also it helps put things in perspective because you know while there are divides uh, in the country, clearly they, it, it's it, it's nothing quite what was like what was happening back then. You know, and 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 you sort of and you you really write it in a way where you could. It starts to percolate. I mean, you, you know, you start with that vicious moment, and 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 then you, you see it percolating within the states, within conspirators and stuff, uh, which I think is what part of what you know what's wonderful about the novel. Because I'm just sitting there going, "What's going to happen? How is he going to get out of this?" Even though I know he's going to get out of it. But Brad, I got I got to ask you, but what what attracts you 
to conspiracies. I mean, I mean, you 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 seem to lean in that direction. What and by conspiracy, let's define that, right? Because they they I think I think you know when you talk about conspiracies, well, actually, I'll let you explain it because I I think yeah, I mean, people, no, I don't want people yeah, to no, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, and listen, my you know, I don't I don't love you know conspiracies of like ooh scariness. You know, when we started first started doing decoded. The, the producer said to me on shows like this on the History Channel, they said, um, on shows like this, the less facts you have, the more scary music you play. And I said, <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic, right? I mean, it was right. so hysterical to me, but I said, I never, ever want to do that show. Right. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I never want to do that show. I'm not here to fear monger. I don't want to. And, mm-hmm. and I said, you know, they had this script for me that said the Freemasons did this and I'm worried about the team and are they safe and are the Freemasons going to kill them? And I'm like, this, I'm, I'm not scared of anything. There's nothing I'm scared of here. The, the, the crew is they're surrounded by an entire crew. The Freemasons let us in here. Like, this is just silly. And to the History Channel's credit, they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to tell the truth. And, and to their credit, they let me. They mm-hmm. gave us all those seasons to let me do that. And I think what people appreciate it is, I don't believe in conspiracies. I don't believe that, like, you know, I, there's not, the government isn't trying to kill you. People are trying to, right? The, the right. government is just made up of us. And people do things for very human reasons, right? They do it for like, whether it's money or power or sex. I mean, they do it for things that are very self-interested that they want. And and sometimes we would say, you know, this is not a conspiracy. This is just nonsense you read on the internet. Here's what really happened. And sometimes we'd say, no, this is the government doing something really bad. And I think mm-hmm. the reason the show took off when it first started airing is because people were like, oh, you're not just here to fear monger us. And I think what I love about them, it's the same thing I kind of love in comics. I just, my wife, uh, I just turned 50 years old and my wife, you know, made the kind of like, had to do like the toast in the video. And the one thing she said about me, and it was actually one of those moments where you're like, I don't know what I think about myself anymore. I've always said that I was attracted and that comics taught me about goodness um, and that that's what I loved about it. Um, but my wife said, you know, I think you're actually attracted to it. I think that it's not that they gave it to you. It's that you actually love it. And it just gave you more of what you love. And for me, what I love about a good conspiracy and what I love about these stories is they reveal not just the good side, but they reveal the bad side. And when you see the bad, you can see more good. And and, and it sounds silly, but I'll say it like this. You want to know who killed JFK? So if you want, you thought you were going to just watch us, uh, you know, Joe and I talk about comics, right? But Let me tell you who killed JFK right here as a bonus, if you lasted the hour that we're talking. So if you look who killed JFK, when JFK was first killed, we said, oh my gosh, um, it's the communists. He was done in by the Cubans. We're, you know, we're in the middle of obviously our, our enemies at the height of the Cold War. It's the Russians did it. The, you know, the Cubans did it. This is the height of the Cold War. And that's who kills him in the 60s. If you look in the 70s, Watergate happens. It's a time we have mistrust for our government. Who killed JFK then? It was the CIA. Right. LBJ did it. It was our own government who did it. The 80s happened, and the Godfather's movie starts to peak. Who killed JFK? It was the mob. The mob killed JFK. So decade by decade, if you want to know who killed JFK, it's whoever America is af- most afraid of at that moment in time. Hmm. And I tell you that simply to say what all conspiracies are is the same thing all heroes are. They're mirrors. They're mirrors. You hold them up, and you see yourself. Show me your favorite conspiracy. I'll show you who you are. Show me your favorite hero, and I'll show you who you are. The only difference is one shows me your fears, and one shows me your desires, and that's what I love about them. They, they reveal us. Yeah, you know, it's it's well, clearly it was aliens that killed JFK, so we could settle that. Um, well, that's next year, right? <laughs> but I, I mean, I I find that having worked and, and you know all these years on the inside of Marvel, right? You know, and and and, and fandom being what it is, there. Are, hundreds of conspiracy theories about why Marvel or DC do certain things, right? And and I sit there and and it puts everything in perspective because I, I I'm not I, I'm not very conspiratorial about anything. Uh, I don't necessarily lean that way. And especially having worked in a place where there are constant, you know, made up stories or stories that are supposedly factual based on the stuff that we're doing when a lot of it is just like either complete and utter happenstance, uh, we just messed up. Or we had no idea that was happening, but you know, right? This, We're not that organized. Out, right? I, I saw it on and identity the, crisis. And the timing, right? And, and so, so being sort of in the eye of that small hurricane, it's Marvel. I could imagine, you know, when, when I hear all these grandiose conspiracy theories, which you know, again, it's just 
people trying to find ordering within chaos. Uh, I go, man, no, it's it, it's not, it's not, it can't be. You no, know? that's why. No, I, I spoke to you know Stan Lee before he died. He was very sweet to me, and he helped me research one of the books I was doing on the origins of Superman because he knew Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster. Right. And and the one thing that was very clear is like we all want to see the grand plan, right? Because when we're young, Stan is the grand plan. And then you meet him and you're like, oh, he's a guy. He's, he's a guy who was like 18 years old and was like, he was his friends and they were just screwing around. Or meeting, you know, uh, Jerry Robinson, who was like, I'm like, why'd you know to save all this art? And he's like, because I was the smart one. Everyone just threw it away. <laughs> like, there was no grand conspiracy. There's no stealing. There's no, but he knew, he knew who invented Batman. He was the one who told me, like, no, like, Bill Finger was there. That's who should get credit. I was like, okay, we're going to start this backwards, you know, working backwards to help him get that credit. It, there are no grand plans, you know, and listen, sometimes you can, sometimes you can find them, but for the most part, we're just humans being human and any, and as, and you see it, right? You've worked on some of the biggest things they've done in comics, right? Obviously you were at the helm of it. And then some of the ones you worked on. And I watched when Identity Crisis came out, when Justice League came out, they were like, you know, DC made them do this and they had to do that. And this was this. I'm like, right. no, it was all done by the time you saw word one. Yeah. Like you can say what you want and, and try and. But all you're trying to do is is make your narrative make sense, and and that's all conspiracies do is they're just trying to make the world less scary. Like yeah. if I believe that there's a, a you know because because you know what's scarier if there's no conspiracy and there is no big giant group out to get you, then it just means that the world is totally screwed up on its own, yeah. and that's scarier. That is far scarier. We invent boogeyman's because they mean they give us a length of if there's a bad person out there. Well, I'm not a bad person, but if there's no bad person out there, then, oh my gosh, maybe it's me. And so we need to invent villains to make us feel good about ourselves. They, that, that's what fills the seats. Well, I also think, I mean, that, that you know, what, what, what guys like you do for a living or myself do for a living, I mean, the, the, the stories we create, uh, I always see them as sort of the, the, the anecdote, the, the antidote to, 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 to the chaos, right? Because so, so people love stories. They want to hear stories because it gives them that structure. Right and 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 the ability to, to to know that well there's good and there's evil and and, and everything in between, um, and and when you do it as well as you do well you know then then you get as successful as you are. Um, so, so Brad, I, I want to go to to a few fan questions if you don't mind. I mean, you want to take some? Yeah, some yeah, of, those? of course. Let's okay, do cool. them. We, we got some that came in uh, that came in through the feed, but I'm going to go through the ones that came in uh, last night. Let's see where where are my questions? Here we go. Uh, okay, so question number one. Uh, is from Eric Enright. Eric's a friend of mine. Uh, what is the division of labor and creative input when co-writing a novel with another author, such as Josh Bench, and how does that differ on the creative front compared to collaborating with an artist in comics? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, so Josh, you know, it's funny. When you write a novel yourself, you have one palette, right? You, get, you have words. You can put them in any order you want, but you got to tell your story with words. Um, and... When I started, when I work with Josh, we have, that's the palette we paint with. So to answer the first part of that question, Josh and I always talk at length, like crazy people about what is this book going to be about? What's the larger theme? And we never can really kind of see it when we start. We, we just like to pretend we can. Um, we knew with this one, it was all about the civil war and about where we are today. I said, you know, just keep that in the back of your head. Even if you're not writing about it, you're writing about it. Like whatever you're thinking about in your life, it shows up on the page somewhere. And, um, so he goes and does, and I'm, I'm very structure driven. So I'll be like, we need to start on that train. Like this train is right. You know, we found that train thing. Josh and I always agree on where to start and he'll do about, he always does the first draft and then I'll kind of read 50 page hunks or maybe even 10 page hunks at the very start to make sure we got the pacing things right. What inevitably always happens is I wind up taking the whole thing apart. Like with the first conspiracy about the secret plot to kill, George Washington, this book here, this, or right. this one, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm doing like a, I, I know, I gotta remember where I am, it's like, I'm Weatherman, yeah. oh yeah, so that book, so that yeah, book, I remember he wrote the whole book chronologically, and I was like, you know, or maybe 50 pages of it, and I was like, no, 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 and he's like, what, and I'm like, okay, this scene right here has three cliffhangers in it, so let's cut it in three parts, and we're gonna take it, and we're gonna put it all the way in the beginning of the book, and we're gonna, now we have foreshadowing for the villain, and then we're gonna take this, we're gonna split this up, we're gonna move these apart, and he was like, what, and I was like, now it's a thriller, and I think, for us, that's been, you know, I think in the Lincoln book, it moved far easier because I kind of taught him how structure works in that in that way in the thriller. Right. Um, but that's how we divide it. And obviously, I'm, I'm in layering in scenes. I knew that Grace Bedell story, the 11-year-old girl. I've known that story for years. I was like, we have to have that in there. The Knights of the Golden Circle, I've done yeah. 
books on and I've done TV shows and I'm like, let's get, you know, don't forget this part. The National Archives has the secret codes. Let's get them from there. So I'm rewriting things here and lots of cliffhangers. But on a comic book, um, it's just super different for me. I mean, obviously the palette we paint with is not just words. It's, it's words and pictures. And I think the hardest part for me when I started and, and, you know, full credit to Phil Hester for putting up with my nonsense, um, is I, and I, to this day, I write the longest scripts cause I'm a novelist. Right. So I literally write every angle. Chris Alapis wants to kill me. I do in the kids books too. I'm like every angle, worm's eye view looking up. So the camera's below Amelia Earhart. So we see the sky and her above us. So we, we just see how big she is and how vast it is behind. He's like, stop talking, Meltzer, stop. Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I don't have to say every word on the page. As a novelist, I finally had to learn to shut up. Let the art do the talking. Yeah. Like just let, when, I, when I saw the first page that I ever wrote that Phil Hester gave me, which I bought and own, I remember seeing my words on the page and I was like, oh, I got to erase some of these words because the art's doing all the story. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I've learned over the years. That's the division that, that you know, is just relying more. Now, it, you know, Chris Eliopoulos and I, he knows, he, we know each other intimately. Like anyone, when you work with, you know, a writer or artist a long time, you, you kind of get in that groove. So he knows when, you know, I'm like, let's do that thing like we did with Infantino in, in the old flat. And he's like, I got it. Infantino, we're going to do this. And I don't have to describe it all anymore. <laughs> right. So by the way, speaking of secret societies, you have your very own, right? It's it, the Invisible Army. We do. We have, listen, as someone who loves secret societies, we have to have our own. So we do have an Invisible Army. We've had it for years. It's the people who sign up for our website, on our website, for our email list. We do not mail you ads. We do not, you know, we actually mail cool stuff. We Over the years, there's actually secret uh, code cards that you have. Oh, they have secret yeah. passwords on them. They bring you into certain things and they let you do, I won't tell you what they are because you have to join and see them. Um, and we give things out to them and we, and I, I know it sounds stupid, but they're the nicest people in the world. It is a, it is an army dedicated to bring more goodness into the world. And That's the awesome. people who join it, every time I meet them at book events, they are the nicest people in the whole world. What's so go website? to our website. What's your website? I, I it's just Brad Meltzer. Go to bradmelcher.com. Cool. Uh, bradmelcher.com and just hit email us or go down there and click on the, the join the list and you will see. But um, I, I love the fact, you know, I think a lot of times the people who, I think the people who enjoy your art, I always say um, they're far smarter than the people who create the art. I love the fact that in my case, they're, they're even nicer than anyone I've ever met. And yeah. I'm, that is one of the things I'm truly proud of. That's awesome. Um, all right, let's see what we have here. Uh, from Paul Lewis, uh, which one of the Sklar brothers is more handsome? Is it oh, that's good. Okay, yeah. So the Sklar brothers, so the Sklars and I went to college together. Oh, really? Um, okay, I didn't know that. They actually, yeah. So we went to college together. In fact, we did a. Um, oh, you know what? I never told this. You got to hear the story, Joe. Go for so it. So this is how the Sklars. So the Sklars and I were. It's my senior year. It was uh, their sophomore year, and there was a big talent show at Michigan. And at the end of the talent show, the begin the way there were three rounds. And the first round was you had to dress up as your favorite hero. So everyone's dressing up as like Albert Einstein and like, you know, Julius Caesar and everything. No superheroes, not a single to show you how the world has changed, right. not a single superhero. But I'm entering this talent contest and I have no talent. I have no I can't sing, I can't dance, I can't do that stuff, but well, I can't dance. But the, I have no discernible talent to put on display, but I want to dress up as a hero. So the hero I dress up as, you can find it on my YouTube page, you, I have footage of it, is Spider-Man. And what I did is, I stole the De David Letterman, but the Sklar's father worked in a Velcro, he sold industrial Velcro for a living. Oh no. So he got me giant oh, no. sleeves of Velcro. I built a Velcro suit, a, I bought a red jumpsuit, put, a, put Velcro on it, bought a trampoline that I think Judd had had first. We had a trampoline and we built a wall and put the other side of the Velcro on it. Right. And then I literally came running across the stage all I wanted to do was this my senior year. I ran across the stage, I jumped on the trampoline and stuck right to it. <laughs> and I was like, the crowd went bananas. It was the greatest moment. And the point of the story is, is when you made it to the next round was your talent round and I had no talent. Mm. So the Sklars wrote me a comedy bit and I did a comedy bit, literally I did a puppet show and the Sklars wrote the comedy bit for me. And, uh, and then the last round was, uh, if you made it down to, that was the final 10, you made it down to the final five. You had to answer a question live on stage. And now I'm in the final five. And I answered the question on stage and I, and I, won, this, I won the stupid thing. It was the greatest wow. moment in my life in college. That's, it that's was pretty awesome. awesome. But it all was thanks to Spider-Man, which I never got to tell that story to you. Velcro Spider-Man, no less, right? So. And it was, but the one thing I also realized, if you're going to try this at home, which you shouldn't, is we only had enough Velcro for one try. And I didn't want to like ruin the suit. I wanted mm -hmm. it to look good. 
is when I, when Velcro is a hook and kind of like, yeah. it's a hook system. And to hook, it takes like a little bit to hook because you're full force and your weight and you slide down just this much. Yeah, I, yeah. But okay. all the weight, I flip my pants. Yeah. So my in front of like hundreds of people, my pants split open. But I but I wound up sticking. So that was save the day. It just 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 adds more to the uh, to the effect. I think. Uh, so let's see. Uh, JTH, uh, how on earth can we get Jack and Bobby back available available digital or Blu-ray or oh, yeah. DVD or VHS? Oh, yeah. So Please. Jack and Bobby. Yeah. Uh, by the way, half of Jack and Bobby, our TV show that was canceled all those years ago. I don't know if you know, half the writing staff writes for Marvel or DC. So it was me. Um, it was Greg Berlanti, of course, who now runs all the, the shows. Uh, my de- like who I love, Michael Green, one of my dearest friends in the universe who wrote for Batman. I, I think wrote for you guys too. Mark Guggenheim was in that writer's mm-hmm. room. Yep. Um, and I can't believe how many people, there were only like 10 of us in the writer's room and like four of us are you know writing comics. So it was the nerdiest writer's room ever, but the best writer's room. Those guys are all still dear, dear friends. Um, okay. And I'll uh, answer the question. I have no idea. If you want it, tell tell Warner Brothers. Tell Warner Brothers. They're yeah. the only ones who could bring it to you. So uh, Jay Hoor, a Hewer, uh, which of his not which of your novels do you think would make the best transition into a graphic novel? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I would go either Inner Circle trilogy, or I, maybe the Escape Artist. I think yeah, the Escape that's... Artist would be a really good. I think Escape Artist would kill. Yeah. Um, I should do a graphic novel of those at some point. Yeah. Why not? Uh, okay. So, so uh, here's an identity crisis question. The central idea of identity crisis is that you can find out who committed a crime by figuring out who benefit, benefit from it. Uh, but that doesn't work in identity, identity crisis because the murder was an accident. So why the emphasis on qui bono? I, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know. You want to answer that? No, no. I, I, just, no? I, I, I oh. don't think it was an accident. So that, that I, I, yeah, no, no. I mean, you know, the, and the central question not to ruin the ending, if you didn't read it, uh, we do ask over and over is who benefits. And I still, I actually still think the end, the ending proves that the ending. Yes. What happens is in the mix of that is an accident, but the reason that the killer is there, and again, I'm not using, I don't want to ruin anything, but the reason the killer is there is completely to benefit themselves. Um, that benefit, they, they see a benefit is going to come to them if, you know, they, they put the scare in. It's just that it obviously doesn't go the way they think. So I don't know. I, I think that's, I think who benefits will always solve every crime. I stand yeah. by it. Let's see. Uh, from Ben DeFeo, how many more years are you giving Harbaugh? Oh, <laughs> let me tell you some, you Harbaugh haters. So my son. That's the thing, right? The, the and, big game. That's the thing is you're just held to a different level. Like we, if, you know, we're in the top ten every year now, and they're still mad. And I'm like, the winning percentage is winning. I, I can't, I can't handle it. I can't handle it. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, this is my favorite question from Jared Wilson. When will Brad write a Marvel comic? Not a page, a Marvel comic, Brad. Oh, uh, I was just saying. I, I, I thought I got out of your thing. I know you've been asking me for years, so. I listen, I would love to, and you know, you and I have talked, we've been friends for a long time now. I mean, I truly know you like, I mean, it's, it's, I know you 15 years because we met during identity crisis and I think, I think we're at like 16 or 17 years. Um, and you and I have talked so many times over the years. Uh, I love when you call me and say, Hey, here's what we're doing. And you and I have talked over the years about, should we do this? Can we do that? And, and, and I always say the same thing, which is like, let me, let me sit on it. Let me see what I can come with. And let me check the, you know, to make sure the book is done. The hard part is, is I used to do all my comic work in between each novel, um, what screwed it all up with the kids' books. So blame Chris Eliopoulos. It was that was what that's why I stopped writing comics so much. Is once the kids' books launched, that's what took the place in between every novel. So right. I do want to do it, and you know what I want to do, and you know I still want to do it. Um, so one day, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, no, we, we we've talked about it. I mean, logistically, it's a bit of an issue, but outside of that, you know, you want to write something. I'm always willing to draw it. I've always wanted to work with you. So, the one that we talk about, the one that we talk about the most, I I believe is going to happen. Okay, it's, it's a possibility. The one yeah. that the one we talk about one every single year right. on my birthday. You on know, your birthday. Yes, every yes. year. I believe. I believe every year on my birthday, I talk to you about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt bad this time because it was your fiftieth, and I felt bad saying. Mm. I think it's I think it's going to happen for my fiftieth, and I think that's going to be the best gift of all. That's what I'm, I'm predicting. <laughs> That's my prediction. I'm sticking to it. All right. This, this one just came in the mail. Let's see here. Uh, a question for Meltzer. I think Identity Crisis is the best crisis, and I always wanted to see a Marvel Meltzer event. Is that something you ever thought about 
and uh, and 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 who would you use? Um, so the, you and I have talked about Marvel events in the past. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I would. I mean, listen, if I'm going to come do it, that's what I want to do. That's the right. fun, right? Play with uh, play with all the fun stuff. And um, who I would use, I will not say because I would ruin the part when we eventually do it because we eventually got to do it. Cool. Yes. And, and, and I know the characters you want to use. Uh, so let's see. Hang on. Pulling, we got two more. Two more, Brad. Um, okay. Probably more in the same vein. Question from Mr. Meltzer. I've heard you talk about your love for Daredevil. Would you ever be down for a, your own Daredevil run? Uh, you so you have no idea how many times I know, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, Joe, um, I love that character. Let me tell you, when oh I was God. in law school, I went to Columbia law school and, and I cursed my friend Jeff Loeb for this, but he, he, you know, pointed out that, that, uh, that daredevil that Matt Murdoch went to Columbia law school. And I was sitting in Columbia law school when that issue came out. And I was like, mother effer, I go here. That's how much I can write this character. Um, but uh, all kidding aside, that my love of Matt Murdock knows no bounds. It's it. It was in Son of Origins. It's it, it's truly my start. Uh, one day, one day, I I, I want to write him. You know all right. that. Okay. All right. All right. I keep hearing one day all the time. It's just. Uh, all right, I'm so last, sorry. I'm sorry. You know. Last one. Last one. Back to novels. Uh, this comes from Christy Richmond. Brad, do you have plans for any more conspiracy books? I love both of the ones you've done. Yes. Thank you. So yes, you know what? I'm going to bring up physical address. So we started with this one. We started with um, the first conspiracy to plot to kill Abraham Lincoln, I mean, George Washington. Then we did Abraham Lincoln. And by the way, Joe, I just have to show you, as someone who appreciates design, yes. they, wanted, they, they wanted the design on the Lincoln book to actually face the other way. The triangle should face the other way so that it would be like they would look better side to side. And I'm like, yeah, but then what do you do for the other? So for we, other ones, we yeah. had to make them match. Right. Yeah. I'm like, you've got to make it match. Like, that's, don't, don't you guys read comics? Um, and yes, we are working on the next one right now. Before that comes, I'm working on the sequel to The Escape Artist. That is really? what comes next. Um, yeah, that's what I'm working on. I've been working on that for a number of years now. Know, just, people, the novels just take me much longer. People have been waiting for that for a long, long time. So that's, that's, uh, I'm gonna, that's I'm exciting getting there. news, sir. Well, Brad, listen, um, first of all, I, I want to hang on. I got to get rid of Christy's question here. Thank you, Christy. Uh, I want to thank you. This has been awesome, man. Uh, and and uh, it's been great to, to sort of dig in a deep dive into the world of Brad Meltzer and sort of what brings you here. For those uh, for those of you out there who have not read any of Brad's books, read the really he's a fantastic writer. I'm going to talk about you, Brad, like you're not here. Uh, and I appreciate uh, and, it. I appreciate it. And Lincoln Conspiracy is really it's just it's just a, another wonderful book. You know, uh, I love your stuff. You know that. So, Brad, I'm going to say goodbye, but but don't hang up from Skype because I'm just going to say bye to the folks and I'll come back. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and let me uh, let me say one thing because everyone yeah. in Skype does need everyone listening on YouTube does need to know this is I've known Joe. You know, you see these things and you and you watch these interviews and and you go like, oh, that was nice or that was fun or I hate them or whatever you take it away from. But the one thing I always knew about Joe when I would watch him online or I'd see him is I'm like, he seems like a nice guy. And I just want you to know that all these years, I know him for like over 15 years now, you are truly one of the nicest guys behind the oh, scene. Man. There's so much stuff that goes on that no one ever knows about. So thanks for being a good friend. And thanks for all you do that. You never take credit for it as much appreciated. Appreciate it, sir. Thank you so much. So I'm going to bump you from screen right now. I'm going to say bye to the folks, but hang on. Okay. I'll be back with you in a minute. Thanks everyone. Right. See you, bro. So guys, thank you so much. Thanks for for, uh, for joining Brad and I. Uh, as you can see, you know, what, one of the one of the, the nicest people in the industry. Great writer. Uh, we need him to do more comics. So just tweet him. Just write him. Go to his website. Tell him to do, especially for Marvel. He's got to stop slumming. He's got to do some Marvel stuff. Uh, but love you guys. So so who do we have next week? Ah, uh, next week. Yes. Next week on Monday. Look at this. My graphics didn't work. It's always something at the end. It was all set up. Let me try it. Here we go. Oh, no. Let's see. You see the name. There's his photo. We got Donny Cates. Donny Cates, finally. Uh, uh, he, he, he had a, a scheduling issue the, the first time I was trying to get him on, but we're, we're, we're finally getting Donny on on Monday. Uh, I believe we'll be on at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And here's the thing. Donny will, of course, be talking about comics. Uh, he will be talking about how dope comics are. But Donnie's going to cut his hair while we're doing the interview. He wants a mohawk. So his wife Meg is going is, is gonna to shave a mohawk while we're doing the interview. So if you want to see that on top of some cool comic stuff, tune in on Monday, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and, uh, and it'll happen, I guess. Uh, outside of that, thank you so much. As always, we'll be con continued. Uh, love you guys. Stay safe. 
Uh, wash your hands, hug your loved ones, and I'll see you guys next week. We watch Kings of Brooklyn.